All right, for our next session, uh, we have Brett and Dino from Microsoft to tell us about Pigeon. Slides up? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, as Benjamin said, my name is Brett Cannon. Uh, this is Dino Veland, and we're here to talk to you about pigeon. And it is pronounced like the bird, not pigeon, pigeon. <laughs> I, I, I can't think of all the random ways we've heard people pronounce it. Basically, the Sorry, that's my fault. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, it's Dino's fault. Um, think of it as Python, JIT, and any and something that you can actually say. Um, and we both work for Microsoft in the Azure Data Science Tools team. And we're here to talk about uh, what we're trying to do, which is basically um, introduce a JIT API into CPython. We hope. Uh, we'll cover why this hasn't quite happened yet, but we're actively working towards basically adding a API into CPython such that you can take a JIT, in our case, uh, a JIT using the core CLR that is open sourced by Microsoft, and see if there's some way we can actually make CPython have a JIT, which would give us both not only faster execution, but also compatibility with extension modules, and have this magical double rainbow world of CPython compatibility, but with a JIT speed backend. So um, the project itself overall has three goals. Um, the first one is this C API that I'm talking about, where we provide uh, an API in CPython to allow us to plug a JIT in. The idea being, we don't want to burden CPython itself with having to maintain a specific JIT. We want to make it basically so there can be a JIT space race within the Python community. So if you want to try to use V8 or Chakra or CoreCLR like we have, or Lua's JIT, or anything you want to use, you could and plug that directly into CPython and have it run, and hopefully be fully compatible with pre-existing um, libraries and extension modules out there. Uh, the second goal was to develop an ex uh, experimental proof of concept of a JIT that does use this API to also help drive its design. In our case, we used Core CLR, uh, which has been open sourced as part of uh, the open sourcing of .NET Core. Uh, and while we're not married to it specifically, like we've talked about using Shaka, for instance, um, we think we've got it working and working reasonably. Uh, and then the third goal, which has kind of been more of a back of the head kind of uh, back of the idea thing is to develop kind of a framework such that if you do use this API that we're proposing and I will cover shortly, uh, you won't have to, as a JIT author, start completely from scratch trying to implement a JIT for CPython. Uh, so for instance, if you have any experience with JITs, you'll know you'll have to make a, a decision on how to dispatch like, oh, this is a native int, it can be boxed, and I need to add that to a float. You should not have to re-implement all of that dispatch code for every time you need to do that for every single JIT out there. We should be able to come up with a C++ framework where you just have to know how to emit the code for your JIT to add a native int to a float. And that's really just driven by the fact that we may change our own code generation backend at some point. We're not fully committed to core CLR. Shocker might work better for us, or we might find something else that works better with Python just because it handles dynamic code better. Yeah, exactly. The, the key point here is that C API for C Python, right? Because whether our JIT wins in the end or not, we personally honestly don't care. What we want is we want Python to win. And to make that happen, we need that API so that anyone can come out and blow our minds with some faster JIT. So whether it's us or someone else, we really don't care. The key, key, key point of this entire presentation is that that API works and we get it into Python and that we have shown, hopefully, that at least it's feasible to do this kind of work with that API. So why the heck would we want to do this? Well, because faster is always nicer. Uh, this idea actually was started by Dino at last PyCon when Layer Hastings at the, Py at the Python Language Summit basically gave this big disposition of what we can do to make Python 3 adoption ramp up faster, and one of the things is always speed. Dino got in his crazy head that, oh, why don't we try to add a JIT to C Python? How hard could it be? So <laughs> he started at the well, conference. We had just open source core CLR, and it has a JIT. And so you know, it, it's not so crazy to just take this thing and repurpose it. Um, at least it didn't seem so crazy at the time. And Dino should admit he has worked on the core CLR bits previously at Microsoft, so he has some very innate knowledge there. Uh, anyway, so he spent part of the conference working on it, and while at the conference, started to get stuff just working. And it got to the point where he spent more and more of his um, 
spare time at work on this, and then I joined Microsoft in July, and I got to start spending some of my spare time at work on this. And so the two of us, actually, in our spare work time, have actually been doing this as our kind of side work project. Um, but the key point here is we wanted it to always be as fully compatible with your stuff as possible, uh, because there's quite a history in Python of JITs, right? So the most well-known one is obviously PyPy. Uh, for those of you who may not know exactly how PyPy works, it's actually a JIT tool chain. It just happens to come with an implementation for Python as part of that tool chain. It's basically the driver of building that tool chain has basically become the, not only the proof of concept and the reference of how to do it, but the key one that most people use from PyPy. Uh, and it works great. It's considered probably the fastest implementation of Python out there. Uh, the biggest issue from our perspective is it's not 100% compatible with all C extension modules out there. Now, they are definitely improving a much better with their compatibility. Uh, Nathaniel Smith from NumPy, for instance, showed, I believe, they had 97% compatibility with the NumPy test suite recently. And they were rapidly iterating and fixing issues as well. Yeah, if you know the PyPy team, they're constantly working and improving, and they work ridiculously fast. So they're definitely catching up, but they're not there quite yet. Uh, there is also Piston that's coming out of Dropbox. Uh, they just hit 0.5, I believe, this week, or last week, now that it's Monday. Um, and they are targeting Python 2.7, and they have their own JIT framework where they have a baseline uh, JIT where they go from uh, basically an, a, a control for all graph to their own basic JIT, and then if anything gets too hot, we'll go all the way down to LLVM. Um, they also have not quite hit full extension module support because they are more of a not completely from scratch, they're borrowing a lot from CPython to keep compatibility, but they are more from scratch than we are, so they do have some compatibility hiccups, which is, for instance, why their latest version has added back in reference counting to try to keep the compatibility. And you mentioned NumPy with PyPy. I think the important thing there is that when we went to run the, Py, the NumPy tests, it, they all just worked. Like, we just first time, Bam. Yeah, so um, the key point that's going to be coming out of these slides here, um, which I'll talk about in a second, um, is we have hit our compatibility numbers, uh, but I'll cover that in a second. So um, I should also quickly mention Numba, which is a numeric specific JIT that Consumer Analytics sponsors. Uh, what makes this different is it's targeted specifically to function methods. It's not a general purpose JIT like Pigeon and Piston and PyPy are. So you have to decorate, so what you do is you decorate your numeric specific functions and methods, and then Nubba will pass that to LLVM and make those run incredibly fast. Um, but it's not designed to be a complete JIT that runs uh, all your code, at least not yet. Um, and then for real old history, uh, there's Psycho and Unladen Swallow. Uh, they're both previous attempts at doing JITs uh, that got to various distances. Uh, Psycho was stopped and became basically PyPy. Uh, Unladen Swallow was sponsored by uh, Google back in 2008, I believe. Uh, but they ran into actual fundamental bugs in, in LLVM and had to spend most of their time actually fixing issues in their JIT at the time because it was so new. And at the, uh, unfortunately, they stopped being funded before they got anywhere past fixing the bugs. But the key thing for us is uh, we have made our compatibility um, 100%. Uh, Nathaniel Smith actually ran benchmarks for, not benchmarks, the test suite for NumPy and showed the numbers at the Python Language Summit. Uh, we were the only ones that were 100%, and we were also the only JIT that supports Python 3.5. So we're and very happy about that one. And we don't support 2.7 at all. It's all 3.x. That's just our entire focus. <laughs> Currently, I guess we're the only real game in town if you want to run Python 3.5 with some form of a JIT. So how do we do this? So from a high-level overview, um, basically we, we do a JIT at the object level. Uh, I know, for instance, PyPy does a tracing JIT, but the way we've structured uh, our stuff at a lower level, which I'll explain in the next slide, um, we do it at the code object level. And basically this gives us exposure to basically anything you might think of as a scope in Python, so, look, so anything within a function or a method, uh, global can even be considered that because um, modules themselves are actually code objects. So you can think of our ability to do analysis and viewing of things at that kind of level. Uh, we use MSIL, which is the core CLR's intermediate language representation as what we compile to. So basically, we will take a code object, take all the Python bytecode, uh, we run a um, 
basically an abstract interpreter over that bytecode, and we do some things such as uh, follow types through, figure out where things do leave and come back into the code, how long something stays like a native int before we lose track of it and have to box it, those kinds of basic um, analyses that you need to do to be able to do some optimizations at the JIT level. And then, um, Basically, we use that. We pass it on to Core CLR, and uh, it does its magic compilation into uh, its representation, and you get yourself a JIT in Python. Basically, we're just using Core CLR as an assembler. So, if anyone's confused and thinking, like, are we bringing .NET into uh, Python? No, it's literally just their JIT component, and we've extracted that out, and we just reuse that piece in a standalone fashion. Yeah, don't, don't think of us as like a new Iron Python. We're not going to magically give you compatibility with .NET or anything. Basically, ignore the word .NET for this presentation. It doesn't exist to us. We're just using core technologies that happen to underlie it. So um, as I said, one of the key things is we're trying to use CPython C API itself to maintain compatibility um, by tweaking CPython itself so that we literally are just plugging into part of the system. Uh, that way, any APIs you happen to use will just flow right through. And uh, it becomes hidden, right? So you don't have to write your extensions to be knowledgeable of Pigeon and what it does at all. It just all magically happens under the hood, and it's just part of the execution environment for Python itself. So how do we do this? Well, originally when we proposed this talk, uh, it was much more complicated. And uh, thanks to some discussions we had with the Nova team, and specifically Antoine Petru, who's also a core developer on Python, uh, we basically came to a much, much, much simpler API uh, that basically proposes giving Python a frame evaluation API. So if you think about what you need to do with code objects, is in Python there's a function at the C level called pi eval eval frame ex. And basically what that function does is it takes a frame and a flag to say whether or not an exception, how to handle a thrown exception, and pass it in, and then what that function returns is what that frame executed to. So all we do here is on the Py interpreter um, state struct, we add a field that takes a function pointer that has the exact same um, calls, um, call parameters as Py eval, eval frame ex, and just make it pluggable. So if you, for instance, import pigeon as an extension module if you want, it can then just set that function pointer to the function that it wants to use to do its execution and work and magically you now have a JIT in C Python. That's it. That's literally the really key hook here. We just basically made it so that in C Python you can control how frame evaluation happens. It's really simple, it's a single function tweak, and magically it opens these doors to this kind of thing. Also, though, it should be mentioned that because it happens at frame evaluation, it opens the door to better debugging. Right, because for instance, now you could potentially write debuggers at the C level that only have to worry about debugging only certain code objects. So now you could potentially get very performant debugging in Python by doing this at the C level instead of what you have to use with sys.setTrace at the moment. Uh, one of the tweak we did do for performance though is we added what we call um, co underscore extra as a field on code objects. You can kind of think of it as a scratch space. It basically is where we stick all of our specific, uh, JIT specific details, but it can be used by anyone for anything, and it's uh, conveniently we made it a actual Python object, so it takes, um, it participates in actual garbage collection. So for instance, when that code object gets cleaned up, it will actually be properly deallocated and cleaned up and follow everything, and that way there's no magical um, management of that actual object. And with that, I will let Dino start to talk about more of the technical details of how all this plugs through. All right, <clears throat> so what we're looking at here is actually what we put into that extra space on the code object. So we have a normal object that is exposed to Python, um, and it has these several fields. Uh, the first thing that we do is we track how often a function has been invoked, because we don't just go off and JIT all of your code all of the time. Uh, that's gonna be a lot of overhead that you really don't wanna have happening. So once a function becomes hot, we'll actually start JITting it um, some code we can't compile currently, mainly that is generator functions, and so if there's any reason why we failed to JIT a function, we'll keep track of that and not continuously try to re-JIT it, even if you're executing it over and over and over again. Um, and then one of the things that we do uh, before we JIT your code is we actually spit, stick in a um, trampoline function 
where we're going to track the types that are coming into that function. And then we'll use the types that you call it with and generate more optimized code. So if you're, you have a function that is doing simple integer arithmetic, we can actually generate code that is going to use tag pointers under the hood, and we won't uh, end up boxing any of those integers until we finally return from the function, and so we can get really fast math that way. So trampoline function goes in first. We record all the types, and that trampoline function can be shared across all of uh, the different functions that are running, and then uh, we'll replace that evaluation function with the optimized code once we finally generate it. Um, the evaluation state is just an extra uh, place to squirrel away more data, and in our case, that is the tracing information that we're recording. And then uh, we want to put some limits on how many functions we actually go off and specialize for. So if you have a hugely polymorphic function, uh, we don't want to kind of generate optimized versions for every single uh, version of it. So we'll have a limit on that, which is the specialization threshold. Um, a lot of the fun here you know, has been the challenge of actually uh, converting the Python bytecode into uh, something that the CLR can un understand. And Guido means, uh, Dino means fun. <laughs> um, when I started this, I was like, okay, this will be pretty simple um, because both uh, CPython and .NET have a stack-based VM, and so doing the conversion from uh, Python's bytecode into CLR bytecode should actually be relatively simple and straightforward. Um, that turned out to be a little bit more difficult than I expected. Uh, so one thing is uh, CPython actually has two different stacks, and it doesn't become readily apparent until you really start getting into the uh, guts of the Python eval loop, um, but it has this entirely independent stack for exception handling. and so. Exception handling ended up being the overall worst part about it. Um, just it, it was painful every single time I had to deal with it. Um, but this separate stack, um, you know, .NET has its own form of exception handling where you declare ranges. Um, C Python does it very much at the bytecode level. So it will push values onto the, this separate stack when you set up an exception handler. Um, it'll push values onto it uh, when you take exceptions and so on. And so translating that into .NET means that we actually have some dependencies on um, how we expect the Python compiler to produce its bytecode. Um, and we don't use .NET exception handling at all. And then the other weird thing is that CPython has these very complicated instructions that uh, vary based upon uh, how your program is actually executing. Um, the worst one of these is in finally, um, where in finally can pop one, two, or three values off of the stack. And .NET is uh, designed to have verifiable IL. And it uh, really wants a constant number of things on the stack at every single opcode that you're dispatching to. So this instruction means that we have to do enough analysis of the bytecode to kind of understand, is this an in finally that's there for a try finally? Is this an in finally that's there for a try accept? Or there's a third case where you also have in finallys for some other reason. And so um, we're probably going to change in finally in Python 3.6 so that uh, it is a little bit more sane. And apparently this is something that the PyPy guys have already done. So maybe we'll just be able to steal it from them. Another fun one was for it or get it or, um, and this is a little bit crazy just because uh, it, it uh, pushes a value uh, onto the stack and leaves it on there throughout the entire loop. And so um, that was painful, and we have some little ugly hacks in that. So, um, and then error checking, super painful. Um, just because uh, if a value is on the stack, we have to make sure that we free it because of the ref counting GC. Um, and so there have been uh, just the amount of code gen that we can end up with is kind of insane. So the interesting thing here is how does it perform? Um, and we've uh, been working on this for a year, part time. Um, there's a bunch of optimizations yet to do, but uh, this is kind of what it looks like right now. So. Uh, the benchmarks on the left are where we're actually doing good. So spectral norm, um, 
is you know negative 65% of the execution time, and then things uh, on the right, which mostly involve string manipulation, we're losing on big time. We lose some optimizations related to string uh, ref counting right now. So um, it's still very early. There's still lots of low-hanging fruit to go after. Um, so I think these numbers are pretty encouraging. Um, and then those are just mostly the default set of benchmarks. Um, and if you look at all of the benchmarks that are in the standard Python benchmark suite, uh, this is kind of how we stack up. So um, a good mixture of being faster, um, and unfortunately, some of them are still a little bit slower. Uh, so um, there's a lot more to do. Uh, I think kind of the next big thing to do will actually be function inlining, um, which should uh, open up a bunch of optimizations where we can do a bunch of things that are cross-function calls. Um, but we also just, like, even with our abstract interpreter today, uh, it's very primitive. It doesn't understand combinations of types very well. Um, so, for example, uh, if you do mixed integer and floating point arithmetic, we only handle that when uh, the integers are on the left-hand side, I believe. Maybe it's the right-hand side. I don't even remember. But one, well, it, it, yeah, it, we we've optimized like int and float it, in that specific order, not o o float and int, just because yeah. time for PyCon. <laughs> Lots of low-hanging fruit, in other words. Um, so we've put out the pep for uh, review to Python ideas, um, and it's really simple. And I think, uh, as Brett said before, it's going to ac actually benefit people other than JIT authors. So. Um, that's kind of really awesome that uh, we ended up with something that is pretty general purpose, I think. Um, we passed almost the entire CPython test suite. There's some uh, failures related to sys.getFrame and tracing, um, and we know we can handle those uh, long term, but it's just not uh, immediately something that we need to focus on. Um, We're NumPy compatible. Yes, and again, that just worked. Um, after passing the CPython test suite, uh, NumPy test suite was just amazingly run it, it all passes. That was actually with no work either. Nathaniel Smith literally emailed me last week saying, hey, can you run the test suite for NumPy? And I went, uh, okay. Because <laughs> uh, we literally have not run any external code on it, and I ran it, and first try, bam, 100%. So we've been really happy with the way we've hit our compatibility. And I think that says something really great about CPython's test suite itself, that yes. it pretty much, it's, it's pretty, Pretty challenging to get through. Yes. Um, and so with that, we'll open up for Q and A. And for Q and A, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So for Q and A, we're going to take a play uh, play from Guido. Uh, we're going to try to alternate woman, man, woman, man. So if a woman likes to have the first question, she's welcome to. Uh, if not, we're open to any questions you have. And, it's, and if no one wants to go first, it's okay. Uh, Benjamin can go first, actually. I'll start. Uh, well, code objects are supposed to be immutable. <laughs> so what yes. exactly are you stuffing in this code extra, and what are you doing to it? So go ahead. So I think that's the most controversial part of our proposal. Um, so that is, it is literally data that if it disappears, it's going to be okay. Um, like, I think the big thing that people do with code objects is that they attempt to serialize them. Um, and recreate them. And if you recreate a code object and you throw away our JIT info, then we'll ha be happy and not care. Um, we don't let you mutate the code object from Python code. Um, so it is just getting mutated from C++ code. And we could actually probably get rid of that. And we just probably really need to do the performance check on it and see if it um, impacts the performance at all. I suspect it won't. And even if it uh, impacts it now, long term, as we start inlining methods and spending more and more time inside of jitted code, that one hash table lookup that we have to do to figure out what is the jitted data for this code object, I think will be uh, so minimal that it won't matter. So maybe we'll end up dropping that, but uh, everyone asks that. <laughs> yes? Regarding CFFI, uh, it has multiple backends for different interpreters so that it can go much faster on, uh, for example, PyPy by interacting with the JIT directly. Do you guys have plans to augment CFFI with pigeon support? Uh, actually, because of the way our compatibility works, it's unnecessary. 
because the C API for C Python just works directly through our stuff, so they don't need it. You just compile for C Python and we'll just work. So there's actually no need. And it, it's nothing that we've thought about. I mean, there could be some possibility of making a faster CFFI that um, integrates in better with external C calls, maybe. Potentially, but, yeah. Um, I, and in particularly, when we start looking at uh, deeper integration with NumPy or things like that, where we actually want to call C functions quicker, um, maybe that'll be something that we'll have to consider. But we're still a long ways off from that. Yeah. The key point is it's unnecessary. It just could be a nice to have, potentially, long term. Any other questions? OK, well, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>